भद्रम कर्णे भी शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षत्रा स्थिरंगयीतुष्टवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्ध श्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 ओम ओ गाड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पेशियस वर्ड्स विद आर इयर्स वाइल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पेशियस थिंग्स विद आर आईज वाइल प्रेजिंग द गाड्स विद स्टडी लिम्स मे वी एंजॉय अ लाइफ दैट इज बेनिफिशियल टू द गाड्स मे इंद्र ऑफ एंशियंट फेम बी ऑस्पेशियस टू अस मे द ऑल नोइंग पूषा गॉड ऑफ द अर्थ बी प्रपिशियस टू अस मे गरुड़ the destroyer of evil be well disposed towards us may brihaspati ensure our welfare om peace 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 all right we are in the second section of the second uh, mundaka in the mundaka upanishad and it's a truly wonderful section it's packed with extraordinary mantras teaching the the essence of vedanta the identity of the sentient being and uh, brahman that you are brahman this is being taught again and again this truth is expressed in these mantras in very exalted in sublime language and from various angles so that's what we have been seeing here basically the way this upanishad approached it was with a question what is that by knowing which everything is known and this question presupposes a causal relationship when the material cause of something is known then the effect is also known known what do i mean by that if you want to know all golden ornaments what you need to know about it is they are all made of gold the material cause of all the golden ornaments is gold the material cause of all clay pots is clay now when you know the material cause when you know the gold you know what those ornaments are notice i want to flag this here you will not know the shapes of the ornaments you will not know the names of the ornaments those things are uh, this they come later um when you know what clay is you know what is the reality of all these pots and pans and jars made of clay but you won't know what kinds of pots and pans and jars they are so one might say that you don't you don't really know everything you know the the substance the material out of which the pots are made you know the substance out of which the jewels are made ornaments but you don't know the details true but notice one thing about the details notice one thing about the product the effects the cause is clay or gold the effects are the pottery or the ornaments notice one thing about the effects all that the names the forms the details they are entirely dependent for their existence on the cause i'll repeat that all the wonderful varieties of ornaments you can make out of gold the shapes of those ornaments the delicate artwork and the, the various names you may give to the ornament necklace tiara ring whatever you may call it all of that is dependent on the gold what do you mean dependent on the gold dependent in the sense for their existence for their manifestation you remove the gold nothing is left all your delicate artwork in in making an amazing ornament will disappear in a trice if you take the gold away from it so the, all of it in one sense is the gold so in that sense if you know the the reality of all things um, the dependent things the the details are afterwards they are all dependent on that reality so it is true in a very vital sense we do know everything when you know the reality the, the substance of everything i'm using the language substance but it's not really a substance quality philosophically speaking those who are philosophically trained uh, it's not in that sense just the reality of everything so the um claim here is there is actually one thing uh, which is at the heart of all things and if you know that one thing you know all things and then the question will arise all right so what is that one thing what is this brahman which is that the reality of all things 
And how do you know it? And the answer is interesting. You have to know it within yourself first. You are among, amidst all things. There are many, many things in the universe and you are there also. We are all there. You have to find that reality, Brahman, within yourselves. We have to find it out what we are in reality. Then we will find Brahman because after all, it's the reality of everything. So it must be my reality. And when I find that Brahman, I will discover to my amazement, I know everything. Because that Brahman is not only my Atman, the very essence of what I am, the truth about myself, it's the truth about the whole universe. So by knowing yourself, you know everything. What was the question? What is that by knowing which I know everything? And the answer was that, of course, he talked about two kinds of knowledge, the higher knowledge, the lower knowledge. The higher knowledge is the knowledge of Brahman. The lower knowledge is all kinds of knowledge. The higher knowledge is the knowledge of the cause. The lower knowledge is the knowledge of the effect. The higher knowledge is taught in the Jnanakanda, knowledge section of the Vedas. The lower knowledge is the ritualistic portion taught in the Karma Kanda of the Vedas and so on. All of this we saw. But the claim was that there is this one reality by knowing which we can know everything. And that reality is Brahman. The word used often in this Upanishad was Akshara, the imperishable. Uh, pointing to an interesting thing, that ultimate reality does not perish, does not come into being, does not go out of being. But all the effects... Everything that is produced or appears from it, manifested from it, they also they all share that impermanence. They come into being and they seem to last for a while and then they go out of being. So the akshara. Now, by knowing this akshara, you know everything. That would be the answer to your question. But then this leads to a further question. How do you know the akshara? You investigate yourself. You ask the question, who am I or what am I? Am I this body? Am I this mind? Or is this something beyond? And we find that there is something beyond. There is this one thing called consciousness, which is revealed when we investigate ourselves. And just by the way, I was listening to a um, talk by uh, one of my favorite physicists, Sean Carroll, as, as good a materialist reductionist as you can ever have, but a very nice guy. And in a debate with somebody somewhere, oh, with Alan Wallace. Alan Wallace is a very well-known Buddhist teacher and an academician. He is thoroughly well-trained in Tibetan Buddhism, is a noted academic and has written many books. Um, I wondered if Rick has interviewed him. Not yet. Um, Not yet. I have feelers out. I, he's always going on long retreats and, you know, so, but I'm working on him. Good. I also listen to that debate. I'm, I'm interested to see what you're going to say about that. Right. Uh, I haven't heard the whole thing yet, but uh, I was listening. For example, uh, Sean Carroll puts forth the materialist picture very cogently and clearly. So there he says that uh, knowledge has different layers. So there is a layer, for example, where it is perfectly valid to talk about, like right now, we can talk about people. You're all people. I'm a, I'm a person. And we have computers and we have uh, tables and chairs. Perfectly valid, he says. This is all right. But there's another level at which we can talk about. And another level at which we can talk about politics, about art and society. And another level of uh, knowledge at which we can talk about atoms and um, you know, uh, protons and neutrons and electrons and quarks. So at the most fundamental level of physical reality, we can talk about that. Now... The claim he makes is that we as scientists, I mean, Sean Carroll and others as scientists, especially physicists and cosmologists, particle scientists and cosmologists, we do not claim to understand everything about everything. We do not claim to understand everything about, say, politics or art. Or, we do not. We know very little about it. However, he says we have a fairly clear picture of what this physical universe is at its most fundamental level, at the level of um, uh, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons and quarks and so forth. All right. So he says that's the first claim number one, that it's pretty complete. The picture is pretty complete at that level. There are certain loose ends, big loose ends, but it will not fundamentally modify what we know about the general nature of the universe, the fundamental reality of the universe. So that's big step one. Now, the second big claim he makes here, so far, everybody should be fine with it. But what follows from this is devastating. He says, 
second thing which follows from this is, since we know the physical reality pretty thoroughly, we can claim now next that certain things are not possible. For example, you do not exist after death. So that's a whammy. <laughs> because then we know the nature of physical reality. So we know the nature of your bodies. And when the bodies die, we know nothing is carried over to some other existence. It is There is no transference of any kind of energy or, or particles to anything else. So clearly, that's the end. So there are huge consequences of this worldview for something like religion, for example. Um, so, of course, Alan Wallace responded to it from a Buddhist perspective. But right there, you know, if I were there, what I would have said is, notice so uh, Sean's language, what Sean says. I know that there is nothing left over uh, when, when a person dies, except the dead matter of the body. I would have said, look at the language you're using. I know in your knowledge. What is this knowledge? So you're already assuming then what knowledge is, consciousness is, awareness is, is reducible to um, electrons, protons, neutrons. And at that point, Sean would have to admit, yes, I, I am assuming the brain, which is made of electrons, protons, neutrons, and other more, even more fundamental particles, is all that you need to explain consciousness. And this is where we differ, greatly so. And this is where there is a very serious jump, uh, what is called uh, an explanatory gap, which even Sean will have to admit. We'll have to admit that we don't know. We have literally no clue, literally no clue how the brain is supposed to produce consciousness. This is where the hard problem of consciousness comes in. And this is from a philosophy of mind perspective, from a neuroscience perspective. I'm not just saying from a Vedanta perspective. So it is not complete. And the gap is right there in the language that Sean is forced to use. We know this. What is knowing? What is knowledge? What is consciousness which is behind knowledge? Is that reducible to brain? And is it reducible to atoms, protons, and so on? Nope. Or to give more emphasis, it's the American nope. <laughs> so, so it's worth, in, even from a scientific perspective, it's worth pausing and not taking that big uh, overconfident jump saying that, no, there is nothing that can exist after death. Um, yeah, anyway, that's just, just by the way. I was also thinking, a second uh, footnote here, is that how would you go from what Sean Carroll is saying to what we are discussing here? The Copernicus, what it is saying. And I was thinking, you have to say five knots or five nopes. <laughs> There are five big steps you have to take to go from what Sean Carroll is saying, the, the mainstream physics today, to Advaita Vedanta, or at least to what the Upanishad is saying. Five no's. First, consciousness, first step, first no. Consciousness is not brain. Second step, consciousness is not mind. <laughs> There's another huge step you have to take. Third step. Consciousness is not an object, not object. Fourth step, consciousness is not many. Fifth step, last, consciousness is not two, non-dual. Let me sum up those steps from mainstream science today to the Vedantic worldview. Five, five steps, and all of them are not, not, not. Not consciousness is not brain. This is where the huge debate now is. The hard problem of consciousness and everything is at this level. Step one only. Step one only. Not brain. Consciousness is not brain. Second, not mind. Consciousness is not mind. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the next frontier. And you have to go even further. Consciousness is not even an object. Then fourth, there aren't many consciousnesses. It's not many. That is where you transition from Sankhya to Advaita. And fifth, there is nothing other than consciousness, not two. Not only there are no other consciousnesses, but everything else, whichever appears, 
the mind and the body and the world and the micro and the macro, they are nothing but consciousness itself. This is where you reach Advaita Vedanta. As you can see, at every step, huge amounts of philosophical uh, um, you know, spade work have to be done. There can be enormous amounts of arguments, different positions you have to move from. So from the present day materialism to non-dual Vedanta, five steps, the five no's. Not brain, not mind, not object, not many, not two. <laughs> All right. Now, we are coming back to the Upanishad itself. When you investigate yourself, you will discover that you are not the body, not the mind. You are this witness consciousness. And you will notice this witness consciousness is limitless. But Vedanta says, it is this witness consciousness alone, this Sakshi alone, which is Brahman. Which is that, that which appears as this entire universe. I'll repeat. The witness consciousness alone, which is Brahman, which appears as this entire universe. So, this is the answer to the question. Your original question was, what is that by knowing which I can know everything, sir? And the answer was, by knowing Brahman. What is Brahman? It is the material, it is the cause of the entire universe. Just like gold for ornaments and clay for pots and water for waves. Similarly, Brahman is that existence which is appearing as the entire universe. Next step. How do you discover and know that Brahman? Because I want to know it. Well, you have to know it as yourself. And how do you know it by, as yourself? Investigate what you are. You find that we are deeply mistaken about what we are. We are not these bodies and minds. There's a whole process, multiple processes, actually, to find out who we are. The method of the five sheets. The method of the three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. The method of the seer and seen. Take your pick. Or even better, use all of them. And come to the same conclusion that we are the witness consciousness. And then you take the further step that this witness consciousness is the reality of the entire universe. When you realize that it is the reality of the entire universe, then it is Brahman. By knowing yourself as this witness consciousness, you have known that by knowing which the entire universe is known. That which is your Atman, that which is my Atman, is the Atman, the self, the reality of everything in the universe. This is the meaning of you are Brahman or Aham Brahmasmi. And this fully answers the original question. And also we see what happens when you realize it. We saw the powerful mantra, one of these exalted, extraordinary mantras which we saw last time. Vidyate uh, Hridaya Granthi. All the knots of the heart are cut asunder. Chidyante Sarvasamshaya. All doubts disappear. Like the blazing light of the sun, no shadow can remain. There's no further doubt about it. The enlightened one can never be confused. It is like the, like the indisputable brilliance of the sun. And then, Shiyante Chastya Karmani, your problems are solved forever. Those karmas which were producing a stream of limited embodiments, life after life, they're burnt forever. They're not going to produce bondage anymore. You, you realize you're eternally ever free. Tasmin drishte paravare. When you realize that as the transcendent, beyond cause and effect, beyond name and form, Nirguna Brahman, I am that. And the immanent. The same Nirguna Brahman is also the Saguna Brahman which is appearing as the entire universe. When you realize this, you are free. So that was the, um, uh, the powerful verse which we read earlier. The eighth verse. Eighth mantra. I would urge all of us also to use these in our practical life to see if this is true. Just imagine that this is true. And then you begin to see how it solves my problems. How it solves my problems at the deepest level, at the most fundamental level. After this, one can say there is really no cause for complaint anywhere. At least from my perspective, the problem is solved. At the most, at the most fundamental philosophical level, at the most fundamental existential level, my problem is solved. Yes. If I want to do further work, like I want to calm and focus my mind, yoga is very useful there. I want to fill my heart with joy and love. Bhakti is most useful there. I want to be of good uh, service to the world. Karma yoga is most useful there. They are all glories and manifestations which will work easily when we are 
centered in our real nature that I am Brahman, if that is clear, then at the deepest level I have no problems. Otherwise, it's a struggle all the time. It's a struggle to be unselfish in karma yoga. It is a struggle to have faith and believe in God and have love for God. It is a struggle to focus and calm down the mind as long as we think we are this limited body-mind. Now we move on. Verse number 9. Mantra number 9. Hiranmaye pare koshe virajam brahma nishkalam tat shubhram jyotisham jyoti tadyad atma vidu viduhu Translation by Swami Gambhiranandaji. In the supreme bright sheath is Brahman, free from taints and without parts. It is pure and is the light of lights. It is that which is the which, which the knowers of the self realize. All right. So what's going on here? These are powerful mantras. The last three mantras of this section, the section which we are reading now, this wonderful section. It's all of Vedanta is really packed into this section. The last three mantras summarize the whole teaching. Shankaracharya says, so let me comment from, let me read from Shankaracharya's commentary. Shankaracharya says, Uktasya evarthasya sangshepa abhidhayaka uttare mantraha trayopi. The remaining three mantras, the three mantras which are going to come now, um, 9, 10, and 11. These three mantras are going to summarize the teaching already given. The central teaching, Ukta Artha, which has already been taught, that's going to be summarized now. All right, let's take a look at this mantra. Atma Vido Viduhu. Those who know the self, they know they know this truth. Which truth? That by knowing which everything is known. Remember, that by knowing which everything is known. Who knows this? Those who know themselves. Look at the link. My question was, tell me that by knowing which everything is known. For uh, a physicist, this would mean uh, the grand unified theory or the theory of everything. An equation, one equation to explain everything. But here he says that the self, those who know themselves. Sri Ramakrishna says, those who know themselves, they know God. Manush nije ke chinte parle, bhagavan ke chinte parle. If, if you, as a, the person who realizes who they are, they also realize what is God. It's the same thing. So, Atma Vido Vidohu, those who know the self. But how would you know the self? Hiranmaye Pare Koshe, what language? In the radiant golden sheath, supreme golden radiant sheath. Sheath, Kosha. Pare Kosha, the supreme sheath. And what kind of sheath is it? It's radiant, it's golden, Hiranmaya. What does it mean? Who you are is to be found where? It is to be found within yourself. Where within yourself? In yourself, in the sheath which is yourself, within yourself. What kind of sheath? The highest. And uh, what's its nature? Hiranmaya, radiant. What does he mean here? He says, what we normally think of ourselves, here, this person. This is actually like a system of caves at the core of which lies the real self. It's like a system of sheaths, coverings, that which covers, Shankaracharya will explain. Like a sword, a sword is covered by the scabbard. You put the sword, sheath it in a scabbard like that. Don't take it literally. It's not that there is the Atman somehow inside and you can pluck it out with tweezers and you know, take a get a procedure done. Can you please, doctor, remove my atman from the uh, from the rest of this messy body mind? That can't be done because this body mind is literally the atman. But in what sense? So there is one way of discerning the atman, which is called the method of the five sheaths, uh, which is very clearly taught in the Taittiriya Upanishad. So you start with the outermost, with, with the most obvious, the body. And this body is, we have done this earlier also, Annamaya, a product of food, what we eat and drink that is transformed into this body. And we are immediately asked to notice that uh, it is clearly changing. Uh, it uh, is born and it ages and it uh, is subject to all kinds of ups and downs and finally it dies. And I am the same one. I, I intuitively feel I am the same entity, person, sentient being, but the body has changed dramatically. 
So changing, I'm unchanging. I cannot literally be the body. The body is intimately close to me, but I cannot literally be the body. Uh, we can say, uh, yeah. And then next, more subtle argument. This changing and unchanging is a bit of a quibbling, but still, more subtle argument would be the body is an um, object to all my senses. So just as these things are objects, I am not an object. This computer is an object. I am not a computer. I am not the object. Uh, this book is an object. So whatever is an object to my senses, I am not that. This is so something that we intuitively agree. I am not a thing. I am a person. I am the subject. This is literally how we define ourselves. I am the subject and to me other things are objects. But then we are invited to see this body is an object. It's an object to your senses. You can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it. It's literally the definition of an object. You objectify the body all the time. Your own body, it's an object to the senses. To the doctor, it's an object for investigation and treatment. So the body is an object. You are the subject. Subject and object are not literally the same. You cannot be the body. And then one more argument, many arguments, many such arguments are possible. One more is more subtle and one I like very much. It's something presented to consciousness. You are aware of it. It is not aware of you. I'm aware of the body. Where is consciousness? On the side of the body or myself? Look, if I had this book, where is consciousness if I'm asked this question? You know, very naive way. Place consciousness, locate consciousness. Would you locate it here? Or here. I am aware of this book. Now, where is this awareness? If I am pressed to give an answer, I will have to say, I feel that the awareness is here on my side, not on the book side. I am aware of it. Similarly, I am aware of the body. I am aware the body is not a, the body is not aware of itself. The body is not aware of anything. Body is not aware of me, but I am aware of the body. So this awareness shows that I and the body cannot be the same thing. I am sentient, the body is insentient. These arguments we have gone through many times, but let's just take these three arguments. Changing, unchanging, object, subject, sentient, in, or aware, not aware. And by because of these reasons, I, the unchanging subject who is aware, is not the changing object body which is not aware. So this body becomes not me, not self. Though it's there, it's I'm, uh, and we say, yeah, yeah, I understand all that. Nobody here disputes this seriously. We'll say, look, I didn't mean I'm literally this uh, skeleton and these organs and stuff. I mean, I am embodied. That's what I mean. When I say I'm the body, I meant I'm embodied. So I'm not the body, but I'm embodied. Body then becomes like a sheath, a sheath which is something that covers. So imagine the self, I'm claiming the self is somewhere in there. So I am in here, I'm embodied, and the body is like a sheath to me. It's not something alien and distant, but I'm embodied here, it's a sheath to me. So that's what's meant by a sheath. And I'm not going to go through the whole five sheaths analysis here. I'm just an example about the body. From the body, you go to the next, phenomenologically, the most present, the, that which is comes up in your awareness. If you want to make it more subtle, look at your body. What, what is pervading the body, but more subtle than that? It is life itself, prana, breath. So am I life signified or represented by the breath, prana? The same arguments, changing and unchanging. Is it an object and am I aware of it or is it aware of me? It will show I am not literally the breath. And then you make it a little more subtle. The breath is also a sheath. The body is a sheath. The breath is another internal sheath. Prana is an internal sheath, but still a sheath, not me. Make it a little more subtle. What is subtler than the breath? Look inwards. You will find emotions, perceptions, thoughts, memories. The mind. The mind is a subtler sheath. Same argument will apply. I am not even the mind. Why? Changing and changing. Subject and object. Sentient, insentient. Now the mind has a higher function. The most brilliant, radiant function of the mind. Intellect. The capacity to understand, comprehend, by which Sean Carroll does his um, you know, cutting-edge physics work, and by which philosophers like David Chalmers uh, will come forth and say he is wrong about consciousness, by which the Upanishads, we are trying to understand this. That function of the mind, called the intellect, it's the most radiant part of the mind. The being radiant, it is called golden, shining, hiranmaya. 
What is Hiran Maya? The radiant intellect. But that also is a, is a sheath. It's not me. I am not intelligence. I am intelligent, but I'm not intelligence itself. It's also like a very abstract kind of covering for me. Why? Apply the same arguments, changing and unchanging. Does our understanding change? Of course it does. It's better. That's how science and everything progresses, because our understanding changes. Then um, am I the same person who moved from not understanding to understanding, from ignorance to knowledge? Yes, I better be. That's how we learn. In that case, I did not, I am the same one. The understanding changed from ignorance to knowledge. Therefore, understanding is subject to change, but I did not change. Changing, unchanging cannot be the same thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to claim I was ignorant. Now I know that I must be the same. Um, then subject and object, even the intellect is an object. Then um, sentient and insentient, even the intellect is not aware. By the way, the mind and the intellect seem to be aware. In fact, the only things that seem to be aware to us, if we look inside ourselves, are the mind and the intellect. Why do they seem aware? The next mantra will tell us. But by themselves, they are not aware. They borrow their awareness from you. So in this radiant sheath of the intellect, what is the name for that? Vijnanamaya Kosha. Vijnanamaya Kosha. What is the name for the, the physical sheath? Annamaya Kosha, the sheath of food modification. Um, what is the name of the vital sheath? Pranamaya Kosha. What is the name of the mental sheath? Manomaya Kosha. Beyond that is the Vijnanamaya Kosha. It says it's the highest, most luminous. Those who have studied Vedanta will say, aren't you forgetting the Anandamaya Kosha, the last one, the most subtle? Yes, but the Anandamaya, two things. One is, it is basically the seed form of the Vijnanamaya. It's when this Vijnanamaya goes to sleep, that's what you call the Anandamaya. The mind has stopped functioning. And second, it is only in the Vijnanamaya that knowledge will arise. In the Anandamaya, when the function of the intellect is not functioning, but you cannot do Vedanta there or anything, or science, or philosophy, or anything. So it is Vijnanamaya which shines, which is radiant. That's why it's called Hiranmaya Pare Koshe. Pare, supreme. So it is the supreme keeping aside for the time being the Anandamaya Kosha, which is uh, um, uh, like a hibernation state or switched off state. But the Vijnanamaya Kosha is the supreme piece of equipment that we have in this body, in the prana, in the mind, in the intellect. But our goal is not the intellect. It is says, it's in the seventh case in Sanskrit, Hiranmaya Pare Kosha, in, the, in that radiant in that sheath, in that golden one, what's there? The witness consciousness. The witness consciousness. It is radiant because the witness consciousness is reflected in the intellect. The reflection of consciousness in the intellect is called chidabhasa, reflected consciousness. That's the consciousness we feel right now. All of us feel the body. You take a breath in and read, release the breath, you all of us feel the breath. Then notice, Thoughts, emotions, feelings. That's the mind sheath. Notice this intellect, this understanding which is going on right now. Thinking and understanding. I get it. I don't get it. That is the intellect sheath. And you notice that sheath is also radiant with consciousness or awareness. You're aware. You're very much aware there. That awareness is not the Atman. That awareness is not pure consciousness. That is the reflected consciousness. And that which of which it is a reflection. Like a face reflected in the mirror. When you look at the mirror, your attention is drawn to the mirror. Then your attention is drawn to your face reflected in the mirror. And you are told, that's not your real face. The real face is that which is being reflected in the mirror. Similarly, go from the witness consciousness there, to from the reflection of the consciousness there, to yourself as the witness consciousness. That witness consciousness is called Sakshi, witness consciousness, Chaitanya, Chit, pure consciousness. Virajam, it is pure. It is pure of ignorance. Ignorance is there in the intellect and it will be removed by knowledge. Knowledge and ignorance both come and go in the intellect, not in consciousness itself. Virajam. And all the effects of ignorance, desire, anger, those are all in the mind, not in pure consciousness. And the actions done through the body, 
not in pure consciousness. Virajam means free of impurity. What is that witness consciousness? It's consciousness only, nothing else. It is, it shines. And that's what you are. The rest is equipment. Our personality, thoughts, it's all there. It's, it's your glory. It's the ornamentation that pure consciousness has put on. But it's not essential to yourself. All of, And the proof that it's not you and not essential to yourself, everything about the personality keeps changing. But you are you still have the intuitive feeling, I am the same. I am the same. And sometimes there are neurological problems. And the patient has dramatic personality changes. Dramatic. They seem to be a different person altogether. And yet we all say, there's no doubt about it. In common sense, and in, in law, in medicine, everywhere, all will say it is the same patient, the same one. The personality can change dramatically. Still it's the same one. So Hiranmay Pari Koshi Virajam, free of all impurities, is this pure consciousness. That's why it's called pure consciousness. Pure consciousness in the sense of pure consciousness only. Nishkalam, it is partless. Consciousness does not have parts. See, the body has parts. Hands and legs and a tummy and a head and a skeleton and whatnot. See, even the mind has parts. The modules for uh, perception and various kinds of perceptions, auditory and... Uh, uh, olfactory and visual, um, the uh, emotions are there, memories are there, memories are again short term and long term. So many components, our whole physical body mind is a modular thing. It's an amazing machine. It's a machine, however, that's what's being pointed out. Uh, but you, the pure consciousness, are nishkalam. There are no parts of pure consciousness. It's not whole or part. Even we give examples of wave and ocean. And water and wave and ocean. So it might seem that, uh, you know, so there is one ocean and we are parts of it. Pure consciousness is not like that. It doesn't have, it's impartite, indivisible, nishkalam. Just as a little aside here. This also sets aside the Vishishtadvaitic idea that the ultimate reality has parts. The ultimate reality is one composite organic whole, Brahman, which of which we are all parts, a bonfire of which we are all sparks, using Upanishadic language, in this very Upanishad, uh, of which the, all sentient beings are parts, and the insentient universe are parts, and there's a whole composite organic unity, that's Brahman. No, 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 no. This language says it's impartite. There is no parts to it. What is this? It's I, it's you, your reality. But the Upanishad says Brahma, the reality of the universe. It is the answer to the, your question. Tat Shubram, it is pure beyond any possibility of impurity. You have purified yourself from body, mind, intellect and witness consciousness. But this Brahman is pure in the sense that even when the universe is there, we will see. Even when the universe is there, its native purity is untouched. That's Shubram, and you are that. And then, further, in what sense um, am I pure consciousness? Jyoti Sham Jyoti, you're the light of lights. Everything in this world is lit up by the sun, sunlight. But the sunlight is also lit up by your eyes. If you close your eyes, there is no sunlight. The world will disappear if you close your eyes. But even your eyes are lit up by the mind. If you don't pay attention, then nothing will be obvious to you at all. And your mind is lit up by the consciousness reflected in the mind, Chidabhasa. But that comes from your original consciousness, which you are. So you are the light of lights, Jyoti Sham Jyoti. We, this is a language we sing every day when we sing the hymn. In the evening, Vespers, Khandana Bhava Bandhana for Sri Ramakrishna in all the ashrams of the Ramakrishna order. At the very end, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, Ujjala Ridikandara. Swami Vivekananda writes there, What is Brahman? What is God? Whom are we performing this ritual for? The light of lights illumining every heart. Heart here means this one. Hiran Maye Pare Koshe, the, the radiant golden sheet, the supreme sheet. That light which illumines every intellect. That's the idea of God here. 
This is the identity of Brahman and Jiva. You, whom are you doing arati to your? You are not doing arati, the ritual to yourself. You are doing the ritual to God. But what are you singing there? The light of lights in every heart. Light of lights shining in my heart. It's, you're talking about your real identity there. So this is it. Jyoti Sham Jyoti, light of lights. And that light of lights is not something outside. It's you, the real you. Tad yad atma vidu vidu hu. What is that light of light? I see it's me. It is I, the real I. But this is the answer to the question which was originally asked. What is that by knowing which everything is known? When you realize yourself as that light of lights, next step, take a look. Everything that you that is in this universe is nothing but let, that light. How so? How so? Didn't we just separate ourselves from I'm not the body, not the prana, not the mind, not the intellect. I am the witness consciousness. So we have separated ourselves. But then now we are saying the mind and the intellect and the body and the prana and the entire universe is nothing but that witness consciousness. The way to understand this is by our dream example. I can trot out that dream example. It makes it very clear. Uh, in our dreams, in your dreams, you are there and you inhabit a world which you don't know it's a dream. There are people and trees and sky and earth and animals and you are yourself there. You can see your own body. It's part of a world. But when you realize, when we realize it's a dream, we realize the whole thing was I, the dreamer. That person in the dream, that was I. And the entire dream world and every other person in the dream, that was I. And they were not really there. What was really there was I and I alone. The dream person, I the dreamer, was the self of the dream person. But also the entire dream universe, I the dreamer, was the self of that entire dream universe. So if this is clear, now apply it to that witness consciousness which you have discovered. So when you have discovered yourself, the entire universe which appears to you is nothing but that witness consciousness. You will notice that when, when we make that breakthrough and we realize, we will see that that witness consciousness itself is that which illumines every bit of our experience. Not only illumines, it is that which gives existence to everything that we experience. In fact, it is the only existence that there is. It is like the dreamer in the dream. It's like the clay in the pottery. It's like the gold in the ornaments or the water in the waves. Every bit of the waves has no existence apart from the water. Just the water itself. Every bit of the ornament is just the gold itself. Every bit, everything in your dream is just you yourself. Though it looks like an object to you. Similarly, everything in this waking experience, in every experience, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, is just that self, that Atman, that pure consciousness itself. It illumines, it lends existence. In Sanskrit, they put it very easily, Sattas Spurti. Satta, the borrowed existence. Purti, the illumination. All of that comes from you. Apply to yourself this, this mantra. What am I? Hiran Maya Koshe. My real nature is shining in that golden sheath. The highest sheath, golden sheath in the intellect. Virajam Brahma. I, Virajam. I am Virajam. I am ever pure. Nishkalam. I am partless. Then I cannot be the body. The body has so many parts. I cannot be the mind. The mind has so many components. Tat Shubram. I am permanently, eternally pure. As what? I am the light of lights. Jyoti Sham Jyoti. I am that which I have realized myself as, as that pure consciousness. This is the answer to the question. What is that by knowing which everything is known? You know, I can put it this way in a very simple way. That... Uh, uh, the answer in you know, Advaita Vedanta is basically just these two words, infinite consciousness, infinite consciousness. Um, first, realize the nature of consciousness, that I am not the body, not the mind, I am the witness consciousness of everything. Realize that first. Second, notice that it is limitless. There is nothing other than consciousness. Whatever appears as a second to consciousness, the object of consciousness is nothing but consciousness. That's it. That's Advaita Vedanta. Then you are everything. You are Brahman. Just these two words. Infinite consciousness. 
All right, let me go ahead. The next mantra is one of the most famous mantras in the entire Vedantic literature. We've already seen it in Katha Upanishad. We will now see it in the Mundaka Upanishad. You find it in both the Upanishads. It was one of Swami Vivekananda's favorite mantras. Um, let me read the mantra and the English translation. We have heard it again and again. This is the source. Natatra Suryo Bhati na Chandra Tarakam Nema Vidyuto Bhanti Kutoya Magni Tameva Bhantam Anubhati Sarvam Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Idam Vibhati The sun does not illuminate, nor the moon, nor the stars, nor do these flashes of lightning shine there. How can this fire do so? Everything shines according as, it, as that shines. By its light, or literally his light, all this shines diversely. All this shines diversely. Natatra Suryo Bhati. So the sun cannot illumine that Atman. What's going on here? Two things. That phrase, the light of lights, is being elucidated here. What is the nature of pure consciousness is being pointed out here? Second, how to know that? That's also being pointed out here. It was said in the earlier mantra, this Brahman is what the knowers of the self realize. That means, in order to know the answer to the original question, what is that by knowing which everything is known? Answer, Brahman. How do I know Brahman? You have to know yourself. Oh, the Atman, the self, have to know pure consciousness. Good. The next question will be, how do I know myself as pure consciousness? How do I know that light of lights? Answer, of course, you cannot know it as, as you understand, normally understand knowing, but that is now being explained here. What would, what would it mean to know yourself as pure consciousness? Nadatra Surya Bhati. So how would, how would I know pure consciousness? Is there a light which can illumine? Um, can I switch on the, the you know, can, can sunlight illuminate or can I know it by the moonlight and so on? No. None of these material lights can illumine the self. Can, can, none of them can illumine pure consciousness. This has a reference to another ancient uh, way of teaching. In the Brihadaranya Upanishad, it is asked, the teacher asked the students, what is that light which by in daytime, by which men see and go out of, you know, go, out, go forth from their home and they work and they come back, they transact and they come back. The student says, sir, it's the light of the sun. When the sun has set, when the sun has set, then what is the light? by which men can see and go forth from their home and they transact and they come back. Why, sir? That is the light of the moon. When the moon has set, when there's no moon, maybe new moon uh, or, you know, uh, uh, there is no moon in the sky, absolutely dark. What is that light by which men can transact and see and go forth and come back? Why, sir? You know, you can say it's light of the fire. He said light of the fire. You can, you can add light of the stars or maybe... Lightning, though that's not dependable. But light of the fire. Why? You can light a fire. When the fire is put out, when the fire is doused, what is that light? So finally he'll go on. Beyond that is the, you know, imagine it's completely dark. No sunlight, no electric light, no fire, nothing. How do you know when somebody's there? And the student says, by the light of the voice, the speech is that light. You say, I am here. Are you there? It's so dark, I can't see you. Yes, I am here. By a voice, you know. Voice is your light. When the voice has fallen silent and so on. So finally, how does a person know? For example, how would you know you are there? The mind. When you go further, finally you come to consciousness. It is that light within the mind which illumines everything. That light, what is the definition of a light? A light is that which illumines everything else, which is, which is not evident without a light. So the room is dark, full of uh, objects. Nothing can be seen without a light. But when I switch on the light, I can see everything, number one. And number two, to see the light itself, I don't need another light. To see the light itself, I don't need another light. To see any object, I need light. But to see the light, I don't need another light. So what's the light? That which reveals itself and reveals everything else. The non-luminous objects are revealed by the luminous objects. And the luminous entities don't need other luminous entities. So a light 
is which is self-revealing and reveals others. Reveals itself and reveals others. That's the definition of a light. Um, so obviously the sun is the most spectacular of lights. And when the sun is not available, it's the moon um, or the stars uh, or brilliant flashes of lightning, Vidyuta. And if nothing else, our mere mortal fire, the little fire you can la uh, light the lamp. Uh, I am Agnihi, this, this little fire which we have, which we poor human beings light. These are lights. They reveal themselves and they reveal other objects. But they, um, uh, objects cannot reveal their revealers. So you can see this book by this light. Light can illumine the book, but the book cannot illumine the light. The object, non-luminous entity, cannot illumine its, its uh, revealing light. Similarly, the, all the objects are illumined by light. Light itself is illumined by the mind. When you pay attention to it, light becomes obvious. The light cannot illumine the mind. The mind illumines the light. If that is clear, then go one step further. It is you, the consciousness, who illumines the mind. Mind does not illumine consciousness. I'll repeat. It is you, the consciousness, who illumines the mind. The mind cannot illumine consciousness. The con mind being illumined by consciousness, now further illumines the sense of sense organs eyes ears skin uh, nose tongue the eyes notice the eyes can uh, illumine all uh, forms colors and shapes but colors and shapes cannot illumine the eyes mm -hmm. and the eyes cannot illumine the mind the mind can illumine the mind can objectify can can know the mind can know the eyes the eyes cannot know the mind uh -huh. And so, just as this book, I can see the eyes can reveal this book, but the book cannot reveal the eyes. What do you mean by reveal? No. I can know the book with my eyes, the book, but the book cannot know the eyes, which are knowing it. Similarly, I can know whether my eyes are open or eyes are closed by the mind, but the eyes cannot know the mind. Similarly, I can know the contents of the mind because of me, the consciousness. But the contents of the mind cannot know consciousness. Right. So this is what it says here. Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam. That shining, consciousness shining, you shining, all the rest shine, um, you know, uh, in series. You shining, the mind shines. The mind shining, shining with borrowed consciousness. The senses shine. The senses shining, we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the world shine. The world cannot reveal the senses. The senses cannot reveal the mind. The mind cannot reveal you, the consciousness. But you, the consciousness, can reveal the mind through the mind, the senses, through the senses, the world. This is the meaning of the term. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam. It also gives you a clue how to know yourself as pure consciousness. Take up any bit of knowledge. Oh, I can see the book. But what is revealing the book? The eyes. The book cannot reveal the eyes, but the eyes are revealing the book. When I, eyes are open, I can see the book. Eyes are closed, I, I cannot see the book. So on. Then what is revealing the opening and closing of the eyes? The mind knows the eyes. What reveals the contents of the mind? Consciousness. I, the consciousness. The book cannot reveal the eyes, far less the mind, far less consciousness. The book cannot reveal consciousness. Just as sunlight shines on the book and illumines it. The book cannot illumine the sun. The sun illumines the book. Similarly, I illumine. And just like moonlight, the sun illumines moon, moon illumines the earth. The earth doesn't illumine the moon. Of course, if you go to the moon and see the pictures taken by the astronauts, very beautiful, earth light, like we call, say, moonlight here, standing on the moon, it will be earth light. Earth is a luminous body shining in sunlight and illumining the moon. Now, uh, similarly, he says here, consciousness shining, tameva bhantam, it illumines the mind. Mind shining illumines the senses. Senses shining illumine the world. The world cannot illumine senses. Senses cannot illumine mind. Mind cannot illumine consciousness. What does that mean? Therefore, if your question is, how do I know myself as consciousness? How do I know that I am this pure consciousness? How do I know pure consciousness? Remember, 
it is not your usual way of knowing. Your usual way of knowing is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. That cannot, eyes cannot illumine, cannot see consciousness. Ears cannot hear consciousness. Your usual way of knowing is mind, understanding with the mind, conceiving with the mind. But consciousness is behind the mind. It cannot be objectified by the mind. So the mind cannot understand consciousness or conceive of consciousness. Then how? But what is it that um, illumines the mind itself? Clearly the mind is known. See, by seeing the book, I am quite clear, not only the book is there, but my eyes are working. It's very clear. I can, When I see the book, I cannot doubt the book, but I cannot also doubt my eyes. Eyes are there. Similarly, I cannot doubt the mind. The functioning of the senses shows the my existence of the mind. The functioning of the mind shows, the experience of mind and senses in the world shows me that I am consciousness. In that sense, you can find out that you are pure consciousness by turning inwards. World to senses to mind to the witness consciousness. Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam. And then, tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light alone, by, your, by consciousness alone, by your light alone, everything here is lit up. Everything here is lit up. That is why, going back to what Sean Carroll said, I know that there can be nothing left over after death. We'll catch him there. How do you know? What is that know? You shining, you know all these things about physics and the world. But what is that shining itself? Is it reducible to the brain? And he will have to say it's reducible to the brain. And that is what is the big question now. Not our question. It's a question in science. It's a question in neuroscience. It's a question in the philosophy of mind. This is the hard problem of consciousness. The investigation into the true nature of consciousness will reveal, will give these results. Not brain, not mind, not object, not many, and not two. Non-dual. Let us read the concluding mantra. A grand conclusion. What a fantastic mantra. A direct answer to that original question. What is that and by knowing which everything is known? Now you see. Mantra number 11. Brahmai Vedam Amritam Purastad Brahma Paschad Brahma Dakshinatas Chautarena Adas Chaudvam Chaprasritam Brahmai Vedam Vishwamidam Varishtam Grand Mantra. All this that is in front is but Brahman, the immortal. Brahman is at the back, as also on the right and on the left. It is extended above and below too. This world is nothing but Brahman, the highest. So, very interesting that it says, Brahman, whatever you see in front of you, this world, literally, what you are seeing in this, uh, in front of you, is Brahman. Whatever is to your right is Brahman. Whatever is to your left is Brahman. Whatever is above, extended above and below is Brahman. Whatever you hear and whatever you smell and taste and touch is Brahman. Whatever we think about, whatever we love and hate, whatever we remember, whatever we understand, whatever we desire and hate, all of that is Brahman. And that which is doing the remembering, uh, uh, recognizing, understanding, sensing, that too is Brahman. Inside and outside is Brahman. The subtle and the physical gross universe, this, this physical universe, sensory universe is Brahman. And the subtle universe of thoughts, feelings, emotions and ideas is Brahman. And the absence of all of that in deep sleep is Brahman. And this is not rhetoric. This is what you realize when you step by step, step back from the body, mind and discover that one limitless consciousness. You realize this. This is what the implication is. Shankaracharya says here that... Um, Yad Jyotisham Jyoti Brahma Tadeva Satyam Sarvam Tad Vikaram Sarvam. That means that light of lights, that consciousness which you have discovered, that is the infinite Brahman. Whatever else you see here, the operative word is else. What is all this in front of me, behind me, above me, below me, physically and mentally, inside me? What are all those? They are like the dream. 
in the dream, when you're watching the dream, it all seems separate from you. But when you wake up, we all have to admit, whatever appeared as object in the dream, all places, all happenings, all people, animals, sky, earth and river, all of it is nothing but I, the dreamer. The dreaming mind appeared as this world. It appeared as a world, it appeared as persons, it appeared as myself in the dream, including my mind in the dream. The subtle world in the dream and the so-called physical world in the dream was all nothing but the dreaming mind. And that's, a, that's the example. We use extend that example to understand what it means when you discover that I am the witness consciousness. That witness consciousness itself appears to you with clothed in name and form. Vikaram means with name and form. It appears as this external, seemingly other, separate from you. But this you, the, it means witness consciousness. It does not mean you, the body. When we think of ourselves as the body, certainly the other bodies are outside my body. Certainly there is a vast universe outside my body. And he says, Brahma, Varishtam. This is the, Shankaracharya says, Paramartha Satyam, the absolute truth. What we are talking about here is the absolute truth. Just like Sean Carroll said, I was just thinking, Vedanta will also say there are layers of truth. And it's perfectly all right to say, I am a tiny part of the universe, but then you're talking of yourself as a body. I am a suffering individual, then you're talking of yourself as a sentient being. And that's perfectly valid. But deeper than that, we know enough now, I'm just literally using uh, Sean Carroll's words, we know enough now based on the Upanishads to say what we truly are is this limitless existence consciousness, please, or this limitless consciousness. And therefore, we can say with certainty, again, literally using John Carroll's words, we can say at a certain level uh, of uh, meaning, layer of reality, all of science is valid and the scientific endeavor is valid and worthwhile. We will know newer and newer things and all useful things at the transactional level of reality. But beyond the transactional level of reality, all of those things we'll discover will be the clay of newer kinds of pottery, will be the gold of, uh, you know, uh, newer kinds of ornaments. Uh, of everything that will be discovered and understood, you will also notice it's nothing but you, that, that uh, innermost consciousness appearing in those ways. The ways in which they are appearing, you can investigate them. Science is a wonderful way of investigating and you'll discover new technologies, new understandings. But all at the level of pottery, all at the level of ornaments, all at the level of the waves. At the level of the water, the gold and the clay is this one limitless consciousness which you are. When you look at it yourself, you call it Atman, the self. When you look at it as the reality of the universe, you call it Brahman. But they are the same thing. Brahma Vedam Amritam, this immortal Brahman alone, Purasta, in front, you will say, the immortal I alone is in front of me as all these people. Yes, the so-called, whether you like them, dislike them, your enemy, most beloved, you alone are your most beloved. You alone are your worst enemy. <laughs> so, in front of me, I alone, the Brahman, immortal Brahman, I am behind. I am above. I am extended below. I am to my left and to my right. I am my neighbor. I am my neighbor. Then, Brahmai Vedam Vishwamidam, literally I am the world, Vishwamidam Brahmaiva. What is this world? It's Brahman. What is this world? It is I. It is literally I. Just as every bit of the dream world is you, similarly every bit of this waking world, the good, bad and the ugly, the peace and the joy and the beauty and the war and death and horror and destruction is literally you. Not escapist. At that level, they are all true. But there's a deeper level, as Sean Carroll would have it, from which we know they are not true. At that level, it is one existence consciousness place, which we are. Shankaracharya says, Iti Vedanushasanam. This is the highest teaching of the Vedas. All right. Let me quickly take a look at the comments. Um, Sean Carroll, some of you have mentioned... I have mentioned this earlier. He gave me a copy of his book, The Big Picture, and he signed it, Enjoy the Universe, Swami. <laughs> but he's a very nice guy. Among all the uh, atheists, 
Um, I think he's among the most approachable, friendly, uh, but he's also uncompromisingly a materialist reductionist. Amira says, can you clarify the difference between individual and collective consciousness in Advaita versus Dvaita Vedanta? That's the thing. In Advaita Vedanta, there is no collective consciousness. Consciousness by itself is exactly as it was said here. Nishkalam, partless. The moment you say collective, then it means collection of parts. So in Advaita Vedanta, you have the concept, concept of a collective mind, uh, which is the uh, Hiranyagarbha or cosmic mind. But the consciousness behind that cosmic mind is still one consciousness. Rajendra says, it is true the word kosha or sheath is not used in Taittiriya Upanishad. Absolutely. The Taittiriya Upanishad uses, Upanishad, original Upanishad itself, uses the term atma. Annamaya atma, pranamaya atma. The body is the self. And then you come to the conclusion, body is not the self. You come to the conclusion, the prana is not the self. The mind is not the self. Um, but the term kosha was, is introduced in the commentary by Shankaracharya. It says, kosha means sheath, like a sheath covers the, some, something within the sheath, and it is not what it covers. So you put a sword, sword in the scabbard. The scabbard covers the sword, and the scabbard is not the sword. In that, in that term, the body, mind, they seem to obscure the Atman, and they are not the Atman by themselves. But remember, when we come to the final conclusion, the limitless consciousness, in that case, mind, body, universe, everything is nothing but the Atman. The Atman alone exists. When you say everything is the Atman, what it means here is the Atman alone exists. It seems to exist as everything. Alpana says, is the mind lit up by Sakshi or Bachida Abhas? Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> so, the... Moon is lit up by moonlight or sunlight? You'll have to say both. It's some sunlight, but it requires the moon also to become moonlight. Without the moon, there wouldn't be any moonlight. So you can't just say the moonlight is only the sunlight. The moonlight is the sunlight, but reflected from the moon. Siddhavas, a reflected consciousness, needs the mind. Consciousness reflected in the mind. What is it? Is it pure consciousness? Is it mind? It is mind, but it appears only because of the presence of pure consciousness. Just as your face in the mirror, is it a mirror or a face? Well, clearly it's not a face. It is the mirror, and yet it's not just the mirror. Without your face, it wouldn't appear like that. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu